is everyone? So good to see you all, yeah? All right. In his essay, The Metaphysical in Man, Merleau-Ponty writes that metaphysics is not a knowledge come to complete or make final, the edifice of knowledges, but is lucid familiarity with whatever threatens or unsettles these fields of knowledge. Metaphysics is the opposite of system, he says, which lets go of the verifiable and resolvable for the sake of the true. He goes on to make a case for poetry itself as that art form that best embodies and engages this practice, not as an instigator of chaos per se, we have enough of that, but to open up what he calls vistas of experience or mind which do not cooperate with or behave the scientific narrative. Essentially, he says that certain poetries restore us and the real to its and our original strangeness. Which is a long way of saying welcome <laughs> to tonight's reading by Ray Armentrout and uh, Mary Rufel, two persistently idiosyncratic and ever-evolving thinkers whose work not only shares an incisive eye and unsettling wit, but a dexterous metaphysical navigation of the temporal and the timeless, and a kind of authority born of knowing the very limits of authority, the very duration and extent of human insight and revelation. As Armin Trout writes, a sign that appears day after day is not a sign. <laughs> Both authors' recent works manifest at once a poignant awareness of our moment, these late capitalist gasps of the Anthropocene, and a curious optimism or defiant vitality. They seem to revel in what the great environmental thinker Donna Haraway would call odd kin thinking, a kind of catalyzing recombinance of mind and life forms and what she calls myriad unfinished and flourishing configurations. It's a mouthful, sorry. It's this kind of fierce, flourishing, and unfailing light that I also find in the writing, thinking, and very existence of our real introducer tonight, whose absence, for which she apologizes, I'm gonna look in the camera because she's watching, is in fact characteristic of her nomadic and ever questing existence. I give you the virtual and mostly virtuous Fanny Howe. <laughs> Here I am, sadly far away from this event. The Woodbury readings have become ever more necessary to us in and around Boston and elsewhere. And so I truly regret not being there in person tonight. Christina has brought the whole world into the hands of technology at its best and liveliest. One of our readers, Ray Armentrout, is an old friend of mine since we met and taught for many years at UCSD. Ray is from San Diego, though she now lives in Seattle. Her poetry seems to illuminate its own busy sphere and rises on paper and screens around this country and others too, as if she were herself a little Uber car on screen, negotiating nobody's orders but clearly going somewhere purposeful. She has been trailed by resplendent awards for at least 20 years now and is one of America's originals, though she remains quiet and consistently focused on the same problems in many ways as a scientist might, examining specimens of words almost as if they were sprung from families of birds and butterflies. A fine observer of nature, she is nonetheless watchful and a critical witness to the way humans behave. She writes a poem a day. That Ray is tonight paired with Mary Rufel, also a quiet 
and persistent American poet who examines language from many angles, including erasures and seeming erasures of herself. No ego, low ego. She lives in Vermont and maintains a dignified distance from mad modern life. She is known to be a terrific teacher. Her poetry, not surprisingly, then often lies in the zone of children in school, not always by far, but more than usual. Also, her poems are composed in relation to the weather, snow and water, cold and shade. Her lines seem to adjust like vines to the spread of the world outside the window. She lays her heart bare and tells jokes. As a child, she traveled with her military family, but has become New Englandly in her life in the heights of Vermont. Like me, she has crawled over the bar of 9-11 and stands in a world barely recognizable. Her scrutiny has a feeling of astonishment. I don't know her at all and regret not meeting her tonight because what she reports in her poems is like a forecast of a resurgence we can sense in the arts and literature. The more we know, the stranger it gets. These two ingenious poets will prove it. Thank you, Fanny. I'm trying to look towards the camera. It's interesting that you mentioned an Uber car because we came here in an Uber that was also a Tesla. Oh my First time God. I've ever been in a Tesla. I mean, whoa. <laughs> the driver tried to show us that it would drive itself, but we were going, no, 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 no. And thank you, Christina, for, for your introduction, too. So I'm going to start by reading some from my newest book, Finalists out this year. And then I have even newer poems that I can read. I don't really actually write a poem a day though. <laughs> Not true. Hang on. Domestic as an empty shopping cart parked on a ledge above a freeway. Artifactual as an acorn barnacle. What is the purpose of barnacles? People ask the internet. <laughs> barnacles are filter feeders. They're fish tank decor. A plaque of barnacles on top of a toilet. This cluster of brittle puckers clinging to its old idea. These craters striped pale lavender for some unlikely eye. Oh, and I think, I, ha I wasn't going to, but because you quoted the poem Vultures about a sign that appears day after day, I think I'll read that one. Vultures. A product can be authentic, an object cannot. This presents a problem. An identity can be authentic, an experience cannot. How was your sleep experience, asks Marriott. Praise or blame is the only legitimate response. Vultures wheel over Miami. A sign that appears day after day is not a sign. The library boasts a fine collection of books written in private languages. Identity is made of select experiences. When you are genuinely sick, the leaves recede, and the flickering holes between them come forward. Not angels, but unnamed objects. My poems are, oh, I skipped one that I wanted to read now. How'd that happen? Post-its are not all they're cracked up to be. Oh, yeah. Threat Landscape. This is in two parts. A lot of my poems are in two or more parts. The, 
But these are quite different. The first one has to do with, or it comes out of something I was reading about the neurology of attention. And then it also goes a little bit into the intelligence community language. And then the second part is actually addressed to one of my granddaughters, so see how that works. Threat landscape. Life began with general irritability, then de developed lateral suppression. The ability to boost some signals while tamping others down. Attention, creating a high contrast world with exaggerated peaks and troughs the threat landscape, projected now on screens by paid experts. You're right, Sasha. The butterflies are frightening with their abrupt approaches and batty swerves. They mix the outside in. You're right. We don't know what will happen. And this one is in six parts, short parts, four of which came from newspapers. Startle reflex. Ford's robo-dogs roam the factory floor and enjoy a good belly rub. People are startled to discover that their inner monologues are ghost-written. A sentence that once made sense and now does not appears haunted. Experts are surprised to learn sparrows across North America have changed their tune. Let's just make it to the end. Everyone's riveted by the shock of the disaster victims, the way they search for words. The fold. Let us, he said, make man, as if he had to ask someone's permission, even if always only his own. To practice is to repeat what has not yet occurred. We get signals from the future. We're invited to grow by entwining, twinning, being duplicitous, a rose by any other rose is its own paradise of luminous folds. I have twin granddaughters, so <laughs> you can see them in here sometimes. The news. We wanted to tell someone everything or everyone something, how large and limp the leaves were in the half sun, but what is half sun, finally? We'd been relaxing protections in our sleep again, it seemed. Now we were fewer. Some imagined St. Peter as a special concierge or a supercomputer listening. Did he listen to what he must already know, hearing only ones and zeros pluses and minuses, was that at least something? Over and over, first one tall stalk and then its twin dips westward and recovers. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> On growth. Dressed all in plastic, which means oil, we're bright-eyed, scrambling for the colored cubes spilled on the rug's polymer. Inside each is a tiny car. When we can't unscrew the tops, we cry for help. We're optimists. To sleep is to fall into belief, airing even our worst suspicions may be pleasurable. We are carried, buoyed. In sleep, the body can heal itself, grow larger. Creatures that never wake can sprout a whole new limb, a tail. 
this may be wrong. <laughs> Depending on how much pollution is in your water, I guess. <clears throat> Riddance. Okay, we've rendered the rendition how often? What were we trying to get rid of? We exposed the homeless character of desire to the weather. Shall we talk about the weather? Worsening four times faster than expected, eight times, until the joy of pattern recognition kicks in until the crest of the next ridge is what remains of division. I think maybe I skipped one I wanted to read. Let's see. I don't know. All right, I give up. Okay. On melancholy, what I thought of as a pleasant lingering on things, tender, without the flurried rush of hope, Freud called melancholia, a state in which a person grieves for a loss she is unable to identify. What I experienced as a general attunement, wishing only to continue, a suspended attitude. Freud described as narcissistic identification with the object that becomes a substitute for the erotic cathexis. And what if, in my case, there are multiple objects? Whatever appears outside this window, the dangling threads of the weeping cypress, how I would love to make the elegant dismissive gestures of those long fingers beside the white phone lines plunging almost straight down or up, taut, catching occasional rays of sun like a child's idea of a message. Cheating. I want to give you the questions in advance. This will seem silly, but listen, there isn't much time Everything depends on it. What is the same? What is different? This may be extra hard for twins. Which is larger? Which is more important? What does the cat in the picture know? Is he sad because the frog is gone? As you go on, the questions will become more challenging. Do you really love the same inflatable black cat? Why that one? Who loved it first? I know you guys are all in the world of standardized tests. Which is which? Being famous is the top future goal in a sample of 10 through 12 year olds. Being recognized as having been seen. Once I wanted to be seen as a famous dead outlaw. <laughs> Then I liked being called incisive, ambiguous, as a sudden pain. Everyone knows these small, shrill birds. No one cares which is which. <laughs> so much for fame, I guess. All right, so now I'm going to read some newer poems, just because I like to do that. Oh, I should. Uh, before I read this one, tell you that there's a word in it that you probably won't know and explain what it is. The word is haboob, and it is a giant sandstorm, so I suppose the, the word is from the Middle East. I don't know if it's Arabic or not. Um, but the way I came across it is when I lived in San Diego, uh, the, the news was starting to report that there were what they were calling haboobs in Arizona in the desert in Arizona, and they would show these giant walls of sand. So anyway, that word comes in. <clears throat> Here I go. Here I go again was a rock anthem once. Crowds on their feet 
mouthing the words. There is no way to explain how faultlessly I want to write about how pointless all this is. Nothing I can point to but the gesture itself, the way it comes to seem anachronistic, spectral, like this ongoing attempt to catalog the world by latching each thing to the last memory it calls up. Nothing recalls the new Cat 6 haboob. But I'm hard to discourage. When a branch lays out five, like an old card trick, identical white orchids, three-petaled light sails spread, ready to go, each with a small bat face in the middle. And this one is pretty new. I was in New York in early October giving readings, and then I, I was walking around with friends, going to galleries, and the two quotes here, I think you'll understand what are the quotes, are things I heard people saying on the phone <clears throat> in very forceful vo voices. Okay. In flight, engage in an activity, one said. Then one said, believe in your feelings. It would be easy to believe our bodies were being operated remotely, like drones receiving instructions, no doubt coded, on the fly. It was possible to feel you had been saved by paisleys, then by natural fabrics in muted shades. Both promised new lives. Once I was saved from monotony and hate by a square of sun on the overhead compartment, tinged faint yellow and lime. Too much time in airplanes. Fortune. It could have started like this. My mother took me to fabric shops when I was a kid. I would wander through the tall bolts, dazed, reading fortunes in the colors. White, paper mache of the mock orange flower on its many stems. Lavender as an afterthought, necrotic, carried interest. Ochre, like sunset in LA, like dehydration. The popular mauve gray, which blends indifference with innocence. One is chosen above her sisters. One tells a troll to eat his brothers. An imp gives one the power to spin yellow into patronage. One frills a frill again and again, no in order, no as if. Everyone says they have their pandemic poem, so this is my pandemic poem. <laughs> Zing. A set of instructions for making instructions. That's a virus. Pure, unencumbered value. Money making money in a host's cell. So streamlined, it's redundant. But what good is a metaphor weighed down with obscure reference when what's wanted is the zing of unimpeded transmission. And this is in two parts that have different titles, even they're so separate. <laughs> and the, the uber title is Further Thought. Genesis 2, when words first had meanings that lasted, that hung in the air after their occasions had dissolved, it was eerie, I get that. Words were gods, arbitrary, deathless. Not every bird or bush would talk, but the idea that any might was palpable. To be at the source and not see it must have driven people mad. Revelations, two. This means that, no, that means this, the twins say urgently. The mystery of the seven stars and the mystery of the seven candlesticks. Balance on one foot as long as you can. 
finally, not afterglow, not the last word, still, they were able to more or less enjoy the feeling of being washed up together on what was not really a floodplain from which the not quite water had receded, leaving a large number of more or less interesting artifacts, which they had learned appeared to them differently, so that what she saw as a large wooden radio, he saw as a fireplace mantle, and what she saw as self-sufficiency, he saw as strangulation. In past times, they had fought bitterly about what things were, what they should or should not be. Now they tried to guess what the other would call any object they spotted. They had come to find failure hilarious and even faked it on some occasions. <laughs> okay. Orders. Pick up the small green notebook and put it back down on the bed. Scratch your chin, thin your forehead. Self-care, someone says. Stare at the coffee maker like it might offer something more, something you don't yet suspect. Touch your fingertips together, there. Pick up the notebook and write this, idly someone says, without purpose or intent. Not the meaningless, but the unmeant is scary. Sublime, someone said. All right, just three more. The daddy issue. God can't tell whether or not he's dreaming. There's nothing to push back against his will. No struggle. He has looped thoughts about being asked to kill his son and doesn't know if this really happened to him or was it someone else. He wants us to call him father. As you can see, I've got lots of references to God, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, <clears throat> not really much of a believer. Angel, when I was almost a woman, the men in the radio called someone I thought might be me, an angel and a baby. I wasn't offended. What did I know? I knew I would have to empty myself to fit inside the songs, and I wanted to be in them as long as they lived, to be called to and never come, to be full of my lighter and lighter self with literally no place to go as it is in heaven. And this is the last one. Um, to her, and I wrote this after uh, seeing some, an art show in an Inuit museum and hearing a story about, about it. Anyway, the horizon. Originally, plants and animals turned into people. And people could turn into animals or plants when pressed, so there were always more of them. As you've heard, a European girl became a tree when hounded by the god of poetry. And in the north, a fox slipped into the tent of a man she loved. When he came back to find a strange woman cleaning up, he complained about her musky smell. She threw on her fox pelt, left, and has not been seen since. The similes we see everywhere today are faint echoes of such transformations. Still, the horizon will change into a mirage again and again. Okay.
silence. Let me tell you everything I know about books, flowers, cleaning. I know where to get the best sponges. Swimming, keep your eyes down, look at the pond's bottom. Far away foreign countries, where to eat. My own little street, four houses and a church. A wandering painter who composed using torn strips of paper. There's even a word for it. How to really look at grass. There's clover, sorrel, sorrel, sorrel and timothy. How to stop pasta from boiling over using a secret. I am happy to tell you everything. For today, I am happy and feel very close to reality. Soon enough. I shall be sad and even closer. <laughs> the bark. Oh, um, oh, I hear something drop. So oh, what I'm going to be reading from is both poetry and prose, very old work and very new work, and I won't differentiate between any of it. Um, if I read something without a title, it's part of an ongoing, it's neither old nor new, but it's just, a, it's just fragments that they don't have titles. It's a weird project. <laughs> the Bark. I took my dog to the lake. He stood at the water's edge and barked. The echo of his bark came back and he barked at it again and again. He barked at his own echo, thinking there was another dog on the other side of the lake. Welcome to poetry, I said. <laughs> All over the world, in museums, things human beings have made are on display. And yet, something essential is always missing. The thrill of the act, what the artist felt while making. This is the essence of art and nowhere is it ever found or seen. It is so fleeting it can only be captured by the artist herself in repetitive making so that the artifacts on display are always disengaged from the private urge to continue. I think this is why Grandma Moses declined an invitation to go to New York and attend her own grand opening. Why would I want to look at paintings I painted? What's the point of that? <laughs> Wet yellow paint. When father died, his ghost used mouthwash. If everyone were a poet, what a sad, sad world that would be. Everything would be covered in wet yellow paint. It makes me want to change the subject. Eleven potted plants were alive all summer. Now they are dying in their big round pots and their abnormally joyous hearts are confused. So short a life, God damn it. No. Every time it starts to snow, I would like to have sex. No matter if it is snowing lightly and unseriously or snowing very seriously, well on into the night, I would like to stop whatever manifestation of life I am engaged in and have sex with the same person who also sees the snow and heeds it who might have to leave an office or meeting or some arduous physical task or conceivably leave off having sex with another person <laughs> and go in the snow to me who is already in the snow beginning to have sex in my snow mind. Someone for whom, like me, this is an ultimatum, the snow sign, an ultimatum of joy, though as an ultimatum beyond joy as well as sorrow, I would like to be in the classroom, for I am a teacher, and closing my book, stand up, saying, it is snowing, I must go have sex, goodbye, and walk out of the room. 
and starting my car in the beginning stages of snow, know that he is starting his car with the flakes falling on its windshield, or if he is at home, he is looking at the snow and knowing I will arrive snowy in 10 or 20 or 30 minutes, and if the snow has stopped off, we, as humans, can make a decision, but not while it is still snowy. And even half snow would be something to be obeyed. I often wonder where the birds go in a snowstorm, for they disappear completely. I always think of them deep inside the bushes and further along inside the trees and deep inside of the forests on branches where no snow can reach, deeply recessed for the time of the storm snow, not oblivious to it, but intensely accepting their incapacity, and so enduring the snow in brave little inborn ways, with their feathered heads bowed down for warmth. Wings, the mark of a bird, are quite useless in snow. When I am inside having sex while it snows, I want to be thinking about the birds, too. And I want my love to love thinking about the birds as much as I do, for it is snowing and we are having sex under or on top of the blankets, and the birds cannot be that far away, deep in the stillness and silence of the snow. Their breasts still have color, their hearts are beating, they breathe in and out while it snows all around them. Though thinking about the birds is not as fascinating as watching it snow on a cemetery on graves and tombstones and the vaults of the dead. I love watching it snow on graves, how cold the snow is, even colder the stones, and the ground is the coldest of all. And the bones of the dead are in the ground, but the dead are not cold. Snow or no snow, it means very little to them, nothing, it means nothing to them. But for us, watching it snow on the dead, watching the graveyard get covered in snow, it is very cold. The snow on top of the graves, over the bones, it seems especially cold. And at the same time, especially peaceful. It is like snow falling gently on sleepers. Even if it falls in a hurry, it seems gentle, because the sleepers are gentle. They are not anxious. They are sleeping through the snow, and they will be sleeping beyond the snow. And though I will be having sex while it snows, I want to remember the quiet, cold, gentle sleepers who cannot think of themselves as birds nestled in feathers, but who are themselves in part, part of the snow, which is falling with such steadfast devotion to the ground. All the anxiety in the world seems gone. The world seems deep in a bed, as I am deep in a bed. Lost in the arms of my lover, yes, when it snows like this, I feel the whole world has joined me in isolation and silence. For God, <laughs> for God so loveth the world. The angels of fear, sorrow, and death are hiding under the lilacs and under the silvery stream running out back where we found a dead rabbit during the winter. Therefore, we have packed a picnic and plan to eat strawberries with our hands. If stained, we can always wash them with the new soap an oval bar set in an oval dish like a baby in a bassinet. New soap, it has never once heard us cry. The good fortune of material existence. Without bringing any more people into the planning loop, I have decided to have breakfast. I have made cautious inquiries and finally learned it is Thursday. My attention sets out in a cheerful mood on a memorable expedition to the sink. Oh, blank and hopeless days, oh, long sleepless nights. They are forgotten now as I turn on the cold, clear water of the stream. All the rivers of the world convene in me. They rush over my hands. They enter my mouth. They cover my face. I am compelled to drink my own tears, as you too will be when you wake. Laredo. <clears throat> it is raining. The sheets are clean. When it snows, the sheets are cold. 
Under the sun, the sheets are bleached. Clean, cold, bleached. The sheets must be like bones. The sheets cover our bones. The sheets, the sheets. The person I want to be already exists. The person I was is still on earth. The person I am is a ghost. For years, I searched for the word camouflage in dictionaries and never found it. <laughs> the tenor of your yes. If you were lonely and you saw the earth, you'd think, here is the end of loneliness and I have reached it by myself. If you were sad and you saw the kitchen, you'd think, here is the end of sadness and they have prepared it for me. Turner painted his own sea monsters but hired someone else to do small animals. Apparently, he could do a great sky but not rabbits, <laughs> much like God at the end. <coughs> My happiness. <clears throat> I laid my happiness in a field. My happiness lay in the field and looked up at the sky. My happiness extended the same courtesy to the clouds. My happiness in the field was visible for miles around. My happiness was visible to the hawk. My happiness was fond of the beetles beside it. A porcupine lumbered by. My happiness followed it. Perhaps because it was being followed, the porcupine stole my happiness. My happiness lumbered along after itself happily. We came to a road. The porcupine went into a culvert and didn't come out. That was the end of my happiness. <laughs> the effusive. <coughs> it's been a great year. I turned 70 and my brother shot himself. I am a tall person who is small and mean inside. For instance, on Christmas morning I wake and begin to take down and pack away all the Christmas decorations. I love Christmas time, December 1st through the 24th, but I hate the glare of Christmas morning, the sound of crumpling wrapping paper, and the belief that it is still actually Christmas. I like to get a head start on things, which is why I'm constantly planning for death. I throw away birthday cards on the morning of my birthday. In 70 years, I have read a great many books, but I do not remember, cannot tell you a single sentence or line from any of them. It seems to me I am merely a walking trunk of titles. I would rather read a children's book than cook. Yet, I believe I am a genuine person, an ordinary normal creature who loves flowers unless they are yellow, Though wild yellow tulips grow rampant in the woods next to my house, and I like them so much, one year I picked a bunch, only to discover they wither instantly when picked. Never hit a child or pick a wildflower is ancient wisdom. Passed on for so long, it seems to have finally disappeared. I find this sad now that I've learned my lesson. I was beaten when I was a child, but like Christmas morning, so what to all that? Nothing stops my life from moving forward toward my death. I hate chocolate. The people who love me keep giving it to me, even if I put it in writing, they will not stop. <laughs> I hate parties of all kinds and give two magnificent ones every year. One is at Christmas, and one is in the spring when the wild yellow tulips are in bloom. 
my guests and I, we sit in silence and stare at the tulips through the trees. It is a genuine moment of feeling sad that we can't pick them, knowing we should not, and understanding they will wither whether or not they are picked. <laughs> the book. That book sat on my various shelves for decades until I got around to it. And then it seemed to be written especially for me. I hope this provides some hope to the other unread books surrounding me who are wondering what will happen to them when I die. <laughs> I don't have the heart to tell them they will all be sold or recycled and we'll never see each other again. I think we do books an injustice by cramming them so closely together on shelves. A certain intimacy inevitably occurs, and when they find themselves separated and stickered with a new price that only underscores their loneliness, there is little that a new reader can do to ameliorate their sorrow, but to read them and say, old friend, you were written especially for me. <clears throat> the novel. I was reading in front of the fire. It was a luxury. It was snowing outside, bitterly cold, but there, ensconced in my snugness, I was on fire with my book, a recently published novel that had been translated into over 20 languages. I was in the middle of a sentence when a thought of my own intruded. Somewhere in the world, someone else was reading the same novel and was in sync with my own reading, reading the same sentence I was, and I was gripped with this knowledge and with fear and terror. I had thought I was alone, but someone else was reading with me the same sentence, a pace with me, word by word, my terror spread. I wanted to be the only one reading, to be in the middle of a solitary act. That is why I had built a fire in the first place, why I had laid down on the couch in front of the fire. But I was not, unquestionably, I was not the only one reading this book at this moment. And I was so utterly deselved, so turned around and so tortured, I stopped reading. I stood up and commanded myself to walk. I told myself that the other reader would be going on ahead, ahead and alone. We would no longer be synchronized. And I could again be an individual with individual pursuits. I walked around the room with my pulse beating, my heart racing. I tried to calm myself. I said to myself, this is ridiculous. And then I lay down again and began to read safe in the knowledge that the other reader was at least a page ahead of me. What a relief. I did not have to share my moment-to-moment -moment experience with him or her or they in Tashkent or Paris, Granada or Stuttgart. And I kept reading. I was calm. I forgot about my irrational fears of a moment ago. And some hundred pages on, when they were entirely forgotten, the author began writing about the fear of the doppelganger, the twin, the mirror, the echo, the identical other. And I was paralyzed again, not with fear of the other reader who was by now pages and pages ahead of me, but with the new fear that the author inhabited me and had my thoughts and that my experience was no longer my own and never had been. poem in which I explain myself. Because there never, oh, sorry, made a mistake. Pause and start again. Poem in which I explain myself. Because there was never an infant in our house I never learned to cry. Because there was not a goldfish, I never learned to swim. Without plants, I could not grow. Without flowers, I did not open. 
A pen was first created by God so he could write down events to come. Without events, what use were our pens? Plenty, it turns out. This is how I write when I'm not being very careful. This is how I write when I'm a bit more careful. This is the best I can do. Um, so I was uh, going to end there, but I'm telling you, I'm looking at the clock. That's my readings done. And I have, according to my clock, five minutes. And I, did, I always like to read something I didn't write. And I brought this thing for you if you want to hear it. It's really amazing. I wish I wrote it. Okay, uh, it's a letter. It's a real letter by a real person. And I can't tell you anything about it because I collect ephemera, I collect old letters, and I, I have millions of pieces of paper in folders, and then years go by, and the, it, this fell out of a folder. I have no memory of where I got it. I can't tell you. And I... I would just love to read it because, you know, it's almost Christmas time. <laughs> no matter how you feel about it, this will put you in the mood. So we'll close with this. It's just a lot of fun. It's written on an old typewriter, OK? Friend Ruth, I am sending you a little something for Christmas now, which I made myself instead of buying something for you, but I could have bought something if I had a thought you would rather have had something bought, only sometimes people rather have things that are made than things that are bought because they mean more, but I don't see how they can mean anything more than what you can read on them because when you say Merry Christmas and from a friend and so forth, people can easily read that and see what it means, but I hope you will like it. I could have bought you lots of things I seen in the stores that are meant for Christmas presents, only some of them wouldn't have been useful, I don't think, because they were made to sell. I guess my grandfather used to, as my grandfather used to say, and he ought to know because he lived through 93 Christmases and he was usually right, so he was probably right about saying it was better to make something for somebody instead of buying something because sometimes they had rather have something you make, but I could have bought you something if I thought you'd rather have it, like a picture or a book, but, but because of your artistical and some of the things they sell ain't so artistical and I'd make you something because I had plenty of time and all the time I was making what I am sending you, I was thinking of you rather than of how much it would cost and whether the store man needed the money worse than I did for your Christmas present. But I could have bought it just as well if not if I'd thought you would have wanted something. You may think it is kind of funny I should be sending you something now instead of waiting till tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but the mail is crowded, ain't they? And trains don't run to North Ad Attleboro very often, do they? And it would be better for you to get it ahead of time instead of too late, wouldn't it? And then I may be so busy tomorrow that I wouldn't have time to make you nothing or buy any nothing either for that matter although I was pretty much decided yesterday that I would make you something instead of buy you something although I could have bought you something if I thought you'd rather have had it and then if I hadn't sent it until so late you might have thought I had forgotten you when you were sending out your Christmas presents but I haven't as you see and I hope you uh, think don't think uh, this part's cut off and I and I some think don't uh, Christmas presents. Uh, um, I don't expect much the year, this year because it is a hard year, isn't it? And we, meaning you and I, have so many people to give things to, haven't we? And then I don't think I ought to get much. But if you are trying to think of what you could give me, don't give me an ashtray because I have one and don't use it much, nor a signet ring because my roommate's father gave me one five years ago and I never wear it and it isn't doing any good in my drawer and I wouldn't want two in there instead of one, would I? And wouldn't, wouldn't want you to give me anything like a pillow because I have two and I wouldn't expect you would want to give me so much as a set of books, though I would like one, but then you, you probably have several other things to give people, and if you don't feel that you can afford to give me one, don't, because I wouldn't want you to. But if you are set on getting me something, but don't get me anything else. But one, one, I guess maybe if you 
aren't buying anything but make me something the way I did. Uh, oh, I guess maybe you aren't buying anything but make me something the way I did you, only if I bought you something else just as well as not if I'd thought you'd rather had something bought. And, but I had just as soon not have something made because I am different from some people and would rather have something bought than made. I guess you have your mind all made up, so don't change it. <laughs> Although women, women can change their mind without anyone saying anything, can't they? But when a man makes up his mind like I did to get you something I made myself, I had to kind of do it. Although I had just as soon have bought you something if I'd thought you'd rather have had it. Please give my love to your parents and friends if I know them, but tell them I don't expect them all to give me anything. But if they say they are going to just the same, tell them they can give me a book to put in with yours, but tell them not to make anything because I don't like made things so much as you do, though I would have given you something I'd bought if I'd thought that you would rather have had a bought one. Your friend, Lauren. <laughs> that's, just, that's great. Yeah. No. Thank you. Merry Christmas. <laughs>